the second here. It was it was simple. It was Mechamonical. Mechamonical. Interview of Mr. Arthur C. Mechamonico at the Carthage Armory, 28 March 2001. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hasselm. Videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark, tape one. Mr. Mechamonico, <laughs> you got me. Tell me where you were born and, and, and when. I was born January 20th, 1926 in Watertown, New York. And did you grow up in Watertown? Lived here all my life from the day I was born. And the only time I've ever been away in Watertown any length of time was during my time in the service, World War II. Tell me about your family. What did your father and mother do when you were growing my up? My father was an immigrant from Italy back in the early 1900s. Met my mother here in Watertown. They married and uh, had six children, five children, one of which died uh, at an early age. The four of us are still living. My brother lives in Massachusetts. I have a sister who lives in Alfred, New York. Another sister lives down in Washington working for the government. And myself, here in Watertown, retired. Do you know how your father came to live in Watertown? Yes, uh, it was before World War I. And uh, they, everybody in Europe was coming to America because it was the, the golden age in this to them. And they managed to get, get uh, enough money to come to Watertown. Uh, they had some relatives that were in Pennsylvania. They went to Pennsylvania first and migrated to Watertown because at that time Watertown was a big rail center and hiring a lot of people. My grandfather worked first for some railroad for a, while, for a little while, then he went into the paper mills of which there was a lot of them in northern New York. Then uh, he went back to Italy and uh, while he was back World War I broke out and he served in the Italian War during World War I as a machine gunner. Mm -hmm. And then when the war was over he took my father, who was then the oldest child at five years old, in fact, it was the first child, a couple, of, couple after that, brought him over here, and they worked in, uh, in Watertown here until they earned enough money to bring the rest of the family from Italy one or two at a time until the whole family came here. And by the uh, early 1920s, uh, middle 1920s, before the Depression years, uh, they settled in Watertown and raised a, a good family, <laughs> a large family. Tell me. Growing up as a boy in Watertown, was it much different than Watertown is now? Not an awful lot. The, the only difference in, then and now is the, is, is the progress has gone over the, over the years. This is we, things we can't stop. Progress is all, always going to happen. But what I remember when I was a kid in school, and I remember second grade, we were taught that Watertown is a city in northern New York, not far from Lake Ontario, Ontario and the Canadian border, and a population of about 34,000 people. And as of recently, it still was 34,000 people. Because it's not the same people. So it's not, not the same people. But we, we, never, we never grew or, or shrunk in proportion, you see. When you were uh, in high school, what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? Well, I went to a very good school, and the teachers were excellent. Uh, we had a very great scholastic record there because they, they would take the time. And they didn't have any failures. They wouldn't allow it. No matter what it took, discipline or otherwise, we learned. And at that point, I had no goal in life because I just wanted a better life than we'd had because I was a depressing child. Mm -hmm. and I can remember much about it even to this day. My family were, had a very hard time during those years. Tell me about it. Well, my father didn't have work for quite some time. I remember the uh, middle of the night, I was probably four or five years old, no electricity, so we didn't have any lights in the house, welfare food. I remember one night my mother was cooking some potatoes and I had to throw the half of them away because they were rotten. She could only salvage the good part. I can remember that uh, my father uh, didn't have clothes to go to work and when he did finally get a job, my mother had to borrow a, a shirt from an uncle so he could go to his first job. I remember that we had clothes from welfare which were hand-me-downs from other people. First time I had a pair of pajamas of my own. Uh, I remember that uh, when we went, wanted coal or wood for the furnaces, uh, the welfare provided it. All we had to do was call and tell them. They didn't give money in those days or food stamps or anything. They provide you wanted to put food, they gave you food. You needed fuel, they provided fuel. So it was all stuff that you had to live on. Uh, medical care was taken good care, but we didn't go to doctors in those days unless you were nearly dying. So it was a very, I can remember very clearly that. And the only thing that brought us out of the Depression, of course, was World War II. We started to pick up. And just at the beginning, of, before the war started, my first father's first job, a man had a wholesale business in Watertown, 
and he was an Italian friend, and he had hired my father for $14 a week to raise five kids on. And at that time, as the economy being what it was, I suppose that was reasonable, but it was still, still pretty tough. We didn't, have, we didn't have the nickel for an ice cream cone. We had the 10 cents for a loaf of bread, mm -hmm. you see. But at, at, at times like that, we, we struggled for everything. And then a couple of, we worked for the man about a year or two, and he gave him another $2 raise. <coughs> he was up to 16 I'm trying to make a long story short. A couple of years later, he asked for a raise. They couldn't give it to him. And I don't know how he managed to do it, but he managed to save $250. Mm. And went out and bought a truck of his own. Went out in the whole same, same type of wholesale business that he was in, food wholesale. And as time went on, and the Wise Potato Chip Company in Berwick, Pennsylvania, seeing the reputation my father had built in his business, hearing about it, came up, talked to him, wanted him to be their agent selling Wise Potato Chips in northern New York. And that's how Wise Potato Chips got started in this area. And now it's a big business up here. Mm -hmm. But he died before he could make it a big success. He died at 52 from a heart attack. And we all said he killed himself working, you see, because mm -hmm. that's the kind of a person he was. But he was a family man, a hard worker, and a diligent worker. So that was my life in early years before school. Well, let's jump ahead. Where were you? Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was at the Olympic Theater in Watertown, which is now gone, status of on State Street, and we were watching a movie. I came out of the movie just about dark, 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, and someone said, hey, they bombed Pearl Harbor. And I said, nobody knew what Pearl Harbor was or where it was. What's that? Well, the Japanese, they bombed Pearl Harbor. We're going to go to war. And that's what I, when I heard about it. What were you thinking when you heard that? 16 years old, I wasn't thinking too much. Mm -hmm. I, I was in the state militia at that time, and we played this game, you know, it was cops and robbers, that type of thing. Never took it seriously because it wasn't a, wasn't a serious thing at that time. But... Uh, then when we got into school, and I went to Catholic school, of course, and the prayers were offered, as they always do, for, that this war would not last long. And then as the reports came in, as we got into the war more and more, we started realizing what it really meant. It was, and then we really got into when all the programs came in, the price, uh, price controls on everything, rationing of everything, drives for everything, uh, rubber drives, tin drives, uh, all kinds of drives to support the war. Um, the rationing was toughest. You couldn't get anything in a grocery store without ration stamps and books. You had one ration book for each member of the family. And one, one was a, a, meat, a, a red book and a blue book. And the blue book was for all types of general groceries. And the uh, red book was for dairy products and meat, butter, things like that. You went to the store with your ration book, and you tore out a coupon. If you got a pound of steak, you tore out a coupon and gave it to them. And you bought enough food for your family for that day. And that ration book lasted a month. If you didn't let it last a month and you ran out, you just waited till the next month. So we did without an awful lot of things. Mm -hmm. Sugar was at a premium. All the candy went overseas. We never saw it, but they said they were sending it to us. <laughs> but the people back home were doing without. But everything was rationed. Tires was uh, impossible to get because they needed for the military. And so if your tires ran out in your car, didn't could not get any more. Gasoline was rationed. They give you a sticker on your windshield, A, B, or C, whichever it was. Uh, qualified you to get so many gallons of gas per week. Businessmen had a had a B ration, which gave them more. Uh, important people got a C ration, gave them even more. A was the least. You got enough just to run your car for your groceries and errands, things like that. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all. But people got into it. They pitched in. They worked. They pulled together. And it's been known the United States was an arsenal of democracy. We supported the whole war. Even before we got into it, we were furnishing England and those places over there for everything they needed. If we hadn't done that, uh, that war, England would probably have been defeated, and it would have been a different war uh, at that point. Do you remember anything about civil defense in Watertown? Oh, yeah. Tell I was a part that. of that. Yeah, we all about. volunteered for that. I was a street warden. Mm -hmm. We wore that white helmet with a civil defense uh, triangle on it, an armband, and we were authority. You walked down the street, and you saw a light in the house well, during a practice uh, blackout. If the people didn't put it out, you said, I'm going to have you arrested. And they had to do it. You know, we weren't that way, but we felt kind of powerful. Uh, being kids, I was only 15, 16 years old. But it, it meant something, and we were drilled on that. And civil so defense was a big thing. We learned how to, how to put out fires in case of an incendiary attack in there, a remote possibility, but that they were experiencing it in England, so the possibility was it could happen here. That was the worst kind of danger to civilians, you see, incendiary bombings. Because they just burned everything. 
What other kind of training do they give you in civil defense? Uh, well, um, first aid mostly, because if any population, people in the population got hurt, you want to know how to take care of first aid with them until they got to better treatment. Uh, conservation of, uh, of anything, if you saw someone doing something uh, around their home that shouldn't be being done, I can't give you instances because it's too nebulous in my mind. But anything that you saw wasn't exactly what they were suggesting we do to make things right, we had to caution people on them, you see. And, did they ever train you in like aircraft recognition? Oh yeah, yeah. They try. Uh, spoke, uh, not so much in Japanese, but they did the German, uh -huh. because we, they, they said well, there's no no chance of them coming over. But we want you to recognize the planes just in case someday you may need to know. You see. Did yeah. they did they set up any spotting stations around? Yeah, there? we had, we had uh, especially on Dry Hill, which had served as a after after the war served as a radar station for the Air Force. But they did have spotting stations up there. Camp uh, Pine Camp at that time, which is now Fort Drum, uh, they had a lot of uh, spotting up there for that reason. Security was tough and strong up there. They built that camp awfully fast. I remember it was nothing but sand and pine trees, and they built a whole camp in three or four years before the war because they started trading up there because our government saw this war coming on. They knew it was just a matter of time that we were going to get into it. They just didn't know how or didn't know when, and the decision was made with Pearl Harbor. But you see, Roosevelt did such a great job with kind of going back to what you asked me about the Depression years. He started these programs, the PWA, or WPA, Works Project Administration. My father got his, one of his first jobs with that. He had to borrow the shirt to go to work there. But it got him to work, you see. And he did, he'd go up water, water lawns at Thompson Park during the summertime when it was so hot and the grass was burning. At night, he'd go water the lawns in the park entrance, which had some beautiful hedges. And he didn't want them to die, so that was his job. He got paid for that. All those stone pillars and walls that you see around top of some car, he helped build those during that project. I had three uncles who were in the old CCC. People don't know what that is. Civilian Conservation Corps. This is where they took teenage boys, not primarily to get them off the streets. All the kids were getting in trouble those days. Everybody stole. The only way you could get anything. So they cut down on crime by putting these kids places, type of army camp, which was good experience for them. Mm -hmm. Because being in the CCC, they wore uniforms, they were, over, they were uh, uh, supervised, lived in barracks, and they were out in the woods somewhere, and that's all they did is conservation work. Uh, cut brush, plant trees, fix up old roads, build some new ones. All the things that they do in the, in the in all of the uh, big parks of this country were started during that time, state and national parks. Get these kids, and they got money for it. But they had to give so much and send it home to their parents. So it was also a means of income to the family. And they could go home once a month and visit. And that was a pre prelude to war that they get an idea of was living in, with another bunch of people like themselves. Mm -hmm. And it served good for them when they did get in the service. It gave them a little bit of training what it was going to be like when they did get in. So there was a little hidden advantage there. Let's come back to two points and then we'll move on to, uh, to your service in World War II. Um, you're talking about the uh, Dry Hill and the uh, Air Warning Service. Um, at that time, did anyone really think there was a chance that the Germans might bomb upstate no. New York? No, no, because if you remember before the war, we, were, we adopted an isolationist government type of, of living, you see, because we figured we had two oceans separating us from everything. And at that time, the world was a pretty big place. A plane didn't come across the, uh, the ocean as it does today. They used to have to fly and land every so often, and it would, you'd never be a, uh, be a surprise coming across. They'd know you were coming. So, you know, we, ne we never really took it seriously. It was just, just in case type of thing. But people would go up the hill with the equipment and watch for planes? No, that was, that was done by the service, yeah. you see, by the government. They, they established people. Uh, there, uh, there was no Air Force as such at the time. But whatever jurisdiction the government put it under, they'd go up and just was prepared to, to look, you know, and more for training than anything at that time. Because eventually, they, if the war came out and they had to go somewhere and do this job, they'd be a little prepared for it. Now, Pine Camp grew very rapidly after 1940. Oh, yeah. Before then, all it was was sand, as I said, palm trees, pine trees. People used to come from all over, pick huckleberries. It was a great huckleberry place. You could get tons of huckleberries up there. They grew wild. Is that where they used to call pine plains? It was first called pine plains. It goes back to Civil War, yeah. actually, that they used it for. General Grant was up there, and they came up, lived in, brought tents, and lived in tents in training up there. Then they developed it, and this, the National Guard put up some cement buildings up near where the airport is now, and they owned five or six cement buildings at all, and they used it for a training area uh, periodically, nothing steady. 
Then it grew from that and from pine, pine plains to pine camp. Then they developed it. And then when there was a threat of war, then they started this big building program and the old camp still stands. And those buildings are only supposed to be temporary buildings for 10 or 15 or 20 years. They're still using them. They spent a lot of time in them. Yes. And that lumber didn't shrink or war. They're just as sturdy as they, they were when they were built and like the lumber you buy today. Well, now, what was the impact on Watertown? I mean, you had the 4th Armored Division there and some other well, units. It was good for Watertown, any, anything, because just as now, if, if Fort Drum were to close down, I can't imagine what would happen to this area. And it was the same then. We depended a great deal, because there was always some kind of troops up there. Maybe not in big groups or big quantities, but there was all good to the economy, especially the bar rooms. Mm -hmm. All right, now tell me how you came to be in the Army. Well, again... <coughs> When I tell the kids in school, when I give these lectures, when I was your age and in school like you are today, we had nothing to look forward to but, but being drafted. Now, back before the war started, as you recall, President Roosevelt started this uh, selective service system. And this was simply a draft system where every boy who turned 18 was automatically going to be taken into the Army, picked by lottery number. And then they went into the service, and they were supposed to serve one year, and then they would come out, and the next group of 18-year-olds each year would be a new batch would be going in. And that's what they did at Fort Drum, they built at, at, at Compine Camp at that time. Built these buildings just for getting the uh, number of thousands of boys that were going to be going in and a place to put them and train them. And that's how it all started all over the country. And when the war broke out, it was no longer one in one year. The next year it was going to be you're going to be drafted and you'll be in for the duration of the war plus six months. And that's the way... So I was 18 on January, in January, and uh, I got my draft notice a few days later. My teacher managed to, my principal managed to get me a deferment for six months because I'd be graduating in June. And I uh, graduated, graduated on June 18th, July the 10th, I was drafted in service, went to Fort Dix, got evaluated. Something about listening to some sounds on earphones made me a radio operator qualified. So they sent me Fort Dix, or Fort Bragg, put me in the artillery, and I became a Fort Observer radio operator. First, they're just a radio operator, but something about, I guess I was small, easy to get around. They thought I'd make a good forward observer. You being in the artillery, you probably know what that means. Oh, yes, definitely. And living expectancy of a forward observer is not very good. 17 seconds. Exactly. Exactly. I went overseas with 42 guys. That picture there. Only two of us came home. Excuse me. Now, Art, what was the, what was the unit you were assigned to? Well, after I took basic training, they sent us over to Fort Ord, California, indoctrinated us for going overseas, got shots, always got shots wherever you went. So they all seemed to want to give you shots. We we're getting four at a time, incidentally. Mm -hmm. You walk through a line, two guys standing beside each other. Each one give you one on each side, and you raise your arm, they give you one in your armpits. <laughs> Production line. Never forgot that. Then they put us on a ship in San Francisco. And I remember the ship very well, USS Effingham, a Liberty ship, which was, which was a hastily constructed ship for, just for the war. Put them together quickly. That's another whole story of mass production. Mm -hmm. Kaiser built them in the coast of Washington. He had all these shipyards there, and he adopted the principle of mass producing these ships. It used to take him several months sometimes to build a ship. And if not several months, even a quick small ship, it took him two or three months. He adopted the policy of taking building in one shipyard just the hull and the keel. Another shipyard would build some, all the stuff that was supposed to go inside the ship, mm -hmm. put it, build it all together. Another shipyard would build all the superstructure, everything went on top. Then with these tremendous big cranes, they'd haul these things all together, and in three weeks' time they had a ship. Sometimes less. Sometimes less. Ten days, I think, right. was the top yeah. record. But I'm talking the average of three, was because all different size ships, that's the way it went. But... Then I got into Fort Ord, in California, in the Fort of San Francisco. It took us 17 days from San Francisco to uh, New Caledonia, which is a French island, South Pacific, just a little northeast of Australia. I went to Fort Replacement Depot there, and the 81st Division had just come out of combat in the Palau Islands, and they'd gotten shot up pretty bad there. It was a, a very bad battle, and we later found out it was a battle that wasn't even necessary. It was not a strategic uh, winning or anything. It didn't help at all in what the next step was. But they thought it might, and they, they, they were the three main islands there. Some bad battles were fought there. And uh, I got into that one with the, with the 81st. Uh, that's where I joined them, New Caledonia. When we came back out of that, the division was so badly shot up and uh, disease. That's a bit more, that's, that took more toll than actual fighting in, in the Pacific. 
all kinds of diseases, sicknesses, malaria is the biggest one, dengue fever, uh, insect bites of all kinds that were highly poisonous, snakes, centipedes and scorpions, uh, spiders as big as your fist, things like this, you know, all poisonous things. Uh, the swamp water is bad because in swamp water, some of those places, if you went into it, uh, and you got a thing called schistosomiasis. Mm. And this is called commonly blood flu. And this is a microbe you can't even see without a microscope. But it, it could penetrate your skin through the pores. Mm -hmm. Didn't have to get through an opening. And once a set got in your system in your bloodstream, it settled into a, your um, a vital organ, and then it would over time would kill you. There's no cure for yeah. it. And that's the way it was. And, that, and a lot of guys died from that. You see, not fighting. And most of the casualties, I would say, were more from, from diseases and sicknesses and wounds, uh, more than, than the actual being killed in battle. So when you were assigned to the 81st Division, you were assigned to a field artillery? Oh, right, guy. immediately, yeah, my training. And because, as I say, my job was, was essential, because they couldn't keep enough people in that work. We were a three-man team. We had a lieutenant, and then the next man was a, was a map man. He was a lieutenant, but had the binoculars to spot targets. The map man would have the chart where we were in relation to what we were going to have as a target and where our guns were, which is well ahead of where the infantry was. And my job, of course, was to be with the infantry or even ahead. You can imagine a situation. Uh, you're in the middle of a no-man's land, presum presumably so. The Japanese are on one side of it and your own men are on the back of you, and both are firing each way at each other, and you're in the middle. Then you got the third hazard. Some guy makes a mistake back at the gun, and he makes a 10-millimeter... Ten, ten, uh, mistake on his elevation site and he's dropping a shell right down on top of you. So you see there's all kinds of, of things that cause the, the, the uh, living period to shorten all the time. Very hazardous. Mm -hmm. And we never stayed in a position more than 10 or 15 minutes if we could, if we could move. Because the Japanese had a way of ferreting us out too, you see. So that's, that's, that's the kind of a, of a war it was. And in those islands, it wasn't a, a defined war like in Europe. You had distinct lines of, of, of fighting and things like that. Over there, it was a lot of little wars. Because you wouldn't, sometimes you didn't even see the guy next to you fighting, you see. So you'd, you'd be fighting in a 10-foot area, and he'd be fighting in a 10-foot area, and you'd not even see each other. Because jungle and thickness like that. And this was your first combat was in, in Leyte? No, the first combat was the Palau Islands with Palau the 81st. Island. Then we went back to New Caledonia. They broke the division up sent the sick ones and wounded back to the States. Some of the older men who were in good shape, they made a cadre out of them, uh, several hundred men, kept them over there for training units, to train new replacements. Because that was the war was about at that time. No longer did organized units go over as a unit into combat. We all got trained as replacements, went over and filled in for where they needed us. Mm -hmm. you see. So then uh, uh, the, the rest of us that were well, I've, I've been fairly new from the States and still in very good health, they shipped us off to other divisions. I ended up going to the 77th, right back in the same work. Within two weeks, I'm right back in combat with them again. And then we go to the Philippines next. I had a, a short uh, uh, battle in, in uh, Guam when I was with, with the 81st on, in the Palau's. Uh, the 81st was in trouble. They lost most of their combat people, radio operators, need, and they were cleaning up. And they needed someone to go over there and help them sight in. They wanted to finish the island by... Uh, destroying the caves that the Japs were hiding in. They didn't want to fight them man-to-man -man anymore. Mm -hmm. Just clean it up and get out of there because they needed, needed somewhere else. So they called for a radio operating team to go over. So we, they put us on a boat and sent us over. And we, you know, it took us three days to get over, three days to get back, one day to do the mission. And we did. We sealed up all the caves, just calling in artillery fire onto those caves and sealing the Japs in. Didn't have time to fight them. One sad experience I had in that, I think it's the saddest thing I did see in spite of everything else, uh, and when we were sealing these caves up, we had a Japanese interpreter with us, and he was talking to the Japanese, trying to get them to come out of the caves. Well, they wouldn't come out naturally. But all of a sudden, out of one cave that was a little low and didn't look like a cave, looked just like the bottom of a cliff, this little fellow comes out, surrendering like this. And we got him out there, and it turns out he was a Korean. And he said to our interpreter, he says, there are people in there that want to come out. And he says, well, tell them to come out. So we called them to come out. They're not going to hurt you. How comes a woman and two children, two little kids, boy and a girl? And I was within 10 or 15 feet when they came out because I was that close there. And she came out and I said, I said, come over, come over here. And she just looked at me. And the interpreter's trying to talk to her and she's just not listening. She takes the two kids, and I have to give you a little geography here. Mm -hmm. The cliffs and, and, and the caves are like this. And it goes down to the cliffs over here, which were about 50 feet to the ocean. She just looked at me and she took those two kids by the hand 
And she turned around, walked to the cliffs, and just jumped over. Because they, they were told how terrible we would treat them if we took them as prisoners. And these were people who were civilians and were brought to those places by the Japanese before the war to do all the work that they didn't want their army to do. Because they'd spent years in the Pacific occupying these islands, you see, before the war. That's why they had such command over there. They owned the Pacific. Now, was this on Guam or was this on Tinian? This was on Guam itself. Guam. Tinian was part of that group. Mm -hmm. We didn't get on that. We just had to clean Guam up. Tinian, they wanted because of uh, that and Saipan, both were great islands. They had great airstrips on them. Guam had a small one. Mm -hmm. They wanted for small planes. But they wanted to develop those others for the bigger planes. Bearing in mind what happened later, it was that much closer to Japan, they could send big bombing raids to Japan instead of the smaller planes, I think. It's terrible what the Japanese told the Chamorro natives. Oh yeah, they they, they tra treated all those natives in any islands they were at. They promised them one thing, but treated them just the opposite. They wanted to bring them what they called the, in, into the uh, Asiatic family, you know, Asia for the Asiatics. And the Philippines was especially uh, bad. They were terrible to the Philippines. And tell us about that. Well, I didn't. Of course, that was after we got to the Philippines, after we cleaned up Guam and, and the Palau's, that we get to the. the Get to, they we're going out. To, they, they never told us where we were going to go, incidentally, until we got there. And even sometimes we got some places we didn't know where we were and uh, never found out. They might have a code name or a number uh, for the place. So when we finally we left uh, New Caledonia once more with the 77th, went to the Philippines. And they told us we were going to Leyte, but we got about a day or two out. When we got to Leyte, uh, we had, had very little resistance. Uh, from from our attack, they got us in. Oh, landed a day or so before the Japanese counterattack. But we experienced a new weapon that hadn't ever happened before: the kamikaze plane. Now, kamikaze is a is a Japanese word which means divine wind. And what this was: these kamikaze planes, where the pilot gets in his plane, and he finds a target of opportunity, and he just dives his planes into it, kills himself, and takes whatever he can with him. It, would be, it might be a body of troops, a supply dump, a ship, whatever he could hit. Well, we learned this was a new weapon we had to cope with. Then when we got, got that uh, into the island itself, we met the Japanese, and we, we beat them. We gave them a good fight. They were tough, and we took a lot of casualties, but we did beat them. Then we had to get across the island to the port of Ormoc, which is a good port on the opposite side, west side of Leyte. Started across, and there's a dirt road that went across, good road. But it was an open jungle, it wasn't a heavy foliage. Tall trees, 150 feet tall. And we didn't realize this as we went in. We got maybe five, six miles across that road, and all of a sudden we're starting losing people from behind, people getting killed from behind. There were snipers in those tall trees, and beside the road there was a banks that went up five or six feet. And in the sides of those banks were holes, and they called them spider holes. And there'd be Japanese concealed in there. And when we passed by, they'd come out and pick us off up from behind. We lost a lot of casualties, and we weren't going to make it across the whole island at the rate they were going. So we turned around, came back, and they put us on LSTs and did an end around play and came up and took over Ormoc from the west. And it was from that point, they set one, one force up and got uh, blown out of the water by artillery on a small island off Leyte. They didn't realize anybody was on that island. So uh, the, the task force had to come back. It was only two or three LSTs, not a very big one. They thought they might start start get a little beachhead established over there. So they sent them back and they took air reconnaissance. They couldn't find anything on the island looked of any size for a force. So they give us a, a whole force and my unit got to go as the artillery part of it, regiment of artillery, of infantry, some supply, supply uh, units and a couple of navy men and they took us to the small island and let us off. We're going to take this island over. Well we got in a couple of miles, nothing happened. So by that time it was getting dark, we settled down for the night. About 10 o'clock at night we got a Banzai attack and these Japanese came out of the jungles howling, screaming, well, just, just noise you can't imagine, blowing bugles and coming out with sticks and clubs and swords and their bayonets and, and they drove us right back to the ocean. So we had to, they decided they had to find out what kind of a force they had on there. We did discover they had artillery is what blew the ships out that went out of the water when they went by on that first, first trip. So they said, we've got to get an artillery uh, observation team up front there, find their, what's there, and let's blow it out of here because we can't, can't wait any longer. So my team got selected to go. So we just about dark the, first, the, the next night, we crawled up through the heavy jungle, and it just started to mist that night. Don't often 
rain at night in the jungle, but this night it did made it tougher. And we got up in there, and where we thought we should be, we hunkered down, and we waited till daylight. And just before daylight, we started hearing activity. Couldn't see it, but just hearing it. And our lieutenant said, I think this is, we're near some kind of a Jap encampment here, so we'll hold it down. And when daylight came, we could see the movement of the Japanese troops and some caves. Again, these caves, wherever there were Japanese, if they didn't have them, they made them. And when the, when, if they had them and they made them, they interconnected them. They were a, def a complete defense system you couldn't get at, you see. So he says, well, we call back a mission, start, start something going here. Somehow or other, I don't know how, but the volume on my radio was up and I didn't realize it. I never turn it up till I turn it on. But it got turned up, uh, uh, probably taking the cover off the thing, and it's, I don't know how. And I turned it on and the signal was when we were in position, I was supposed to take my mic and push the button twice. That would give you clicks that they'd hear in the back there. They would come back with one click, telling me that they'd received me. Then we would figure out our mission. I turned the radio up to where I could talk, and then I'd talk back to them and tell them what we wanted. Well, when I turned the radio on after I gave the clicks, a blast of static came out of it. I had it up loud, and it just so happened a Japanese patrol was walking by about 20 yards from us. And they heard that, and they jumped us and smashed the radio and took us in. So for three days we were their guests, and they had this colonel spoke better English than I did. And he talked to us and said, well, I don't know what kind of a force that he was facing, because he, he says, we won't give up easy. Uh, we probably won't win this, but we're gonna make, not going to make it easy for you. What, what's your unit? We told him that under the Geneva Convention, we're not obliged to give anything more than our name, rank, and serial number. And that's all we did. Got sick of hearing it. He says, hey, we're not a signatory to the Geneva Convention, so no, we don't recognize it. And he says, we'll get it out of you one way or another. And they did. They beat us. They do whatever they could to make us talk. And my, uh, minor torches. Uh, not, not real bad stuff, but enough. You wanted to talk. And, uh, but I got stubborn. After a while, I got, I got so I was hurting so bad, it didn't hurt anymore. And I said, there ain't anything more you can do to me that's going to make me tell you anything's going to help you. I'm just not going to do it. So the third day, he's come up to his phone. He says, I, I, we're going to pull a Banzai intact tonight at 10 o'clock. And he says, I'm not going to be responsible for what will happen to you from that point on. I don't know what my mental do to you. I don't know what's going to happen in the attack. But I'm not going to worry about you. But he says, you, you can bet none of us are going to come out of this. I said, well. So the three of us sat in our cave at the Asanas talking. And the lieutenant said, well, if you guys want to talk, he says, I won't turn it in. He says, we've gone through all that we've gone together. And he says, you've gone done through a lot. And he says, I'll just turn deaf here because I think we've gone through enough. I says, I, I just don't care anymore. I think if I, if, if I wanted to die at that point, at any time, I think it was at that point. I just didn't care anymore. I didn't want to ever die. But you do reach a point that you wonder which, which is the easiest way. So just at that time when the Banzai attack was supposed to start, I heard this explosion, long way off. Being in the artillery, we became so familiar with our guns, you could even tell which gun was firing when they fired individually. And I said to the lieutenant, I said, Lieutenant, I think I heard number three gun just fire. He says, I don't think so. And I hadn't anymore said that. Shell land right in front of our cave killed a guard. So we got his rifle. And I said, come on, let's get out of here. He's got a chance to go. So we started out, and just as we came around this outcropping of rock, a Japanese sentry came to see what's going on. And he raised his rifle and, sh and shot, and he caught the lieutenant right through the chest. And the bullet came out of his back right past my ear. Didn't kill him. We later found I went through the top of his lung. And I said to the other fellow, I said, Saul, come on, help me. I said, he's shot. And I said, here, we got another rifle. We took care of the, 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 the guard because we had one rifle. I said, get, let's get him out of here. So we used our two rifles as a stretcher, picked him up and carried him. I don't know how long. It was dark, 100 yards, maybe in the jungle. And something about in the jungle, you, you do, your senses become clearer. And you see things that you don't think you'd see. Of course, in the jungle, it's dark. But here's a place that looked a little bit darker. I said, we headed for that, and it happened to be, it was a square hole cut, they were making a pillbox. And all it was was three sides, the front and two sides, and the back was still open, no roof on it. So I said, geez, you're a good place to wait this out. I said, because when that barrage comes in, you know what's going to happen. Because they're going to fire those shells all over the place till they make sure they saturate everything. So we got in there and we waited it out all through the night while the barrage did happen. About daylight the next morning, a couple of scouts were coming up through to see where, what, the, what the lay of the land was, infantry scouts, that they all sent them out. 
And I happened to be looking over the edge of the thing just at daylight. I saw this little movement about 50 yards away. And I thought, well, it's just things in the jungle happening, but sometimes you think you see things. And I saw the movement again. I could make out the roundness of a helmet. And I waited a little bit, and they crawled a little closer, and finally I was able to call out. I said, I said to, we're over here. I said, where's so-and-so? I gave him a 906 field artillery. And this sniper, this uh, scout stuck his head up, just sent a machine gun on the hill back of his fire and killed him. And the other guy tried to get away too, and he stuck his head up, and he got killed. So I just crawled out and got there jackets off and their medical kits and water because this lieutenant was suffering. He wasn't bleeding bad for the two wounds, but it was, we, were, we didn't have any clothes. They took our clothes away from us. All they left us was our shorts and socks. Took our ID bracelets, ID uh, watches, dog tags, everything, souvenirs, you know. And I went and got their stuff and we gave first aid as we could. The good old sulfa drug, which was a miracle, which was a miracle drug at that time. We all carried them, pills and, and powder. If you got wounded, you sprinkled the powder in the wound and you took all the pills that you could take by water mm -hmm. and built a tremendous defense against infection. So I got these medical kits and we took care of the lieutenant. We used our undershorts and socks to staunch the bleeding on his, on his uh, wounds till, till we got the medical kits from these two fellows. And we put the compress bandages that came out of them. And later we found out, they told us, if it hadn't been for that, he would have died. I don't know why he didn't die sooner. He laid all night that way. So he, I guess he had a good constitution. And what we did, I guess, was done in time. So it was a while longer. And then finally we saw some more movement coming up, and we heard battle starting on where we'd come from, so the attack was going on. And there was a scouting team came up, a whole squad of men, and I told us, get down, there's a machine gun nest up on the hill over here. And the guy says, who are you? And I told him, get down. I says, so we sent a couple, flanked the machine gun nest, sent a couple of fellows up with it. They got around each side of it, and they threw a couple of grenades and destroyed the nest. And they came over to see who we were. Oh, you must be the three guys that's been missing. I says, yeah, we're the three guys. Don't we look it? And there's these 12 guys standing around. I never saw 12 guys cry like those guys did. They felt worse than we did, I think. They called in. They got us back. Called for some stretcher bearers and first aid people. They got us back, went through our lanes and lines. And that's the rest I remembered until they put us on a boat, sent us back to Leyte, and we put us in a field hospital. The lieutenant got sent back to the States. He made it back and he lived. So the other fellow and I, we just were just run down from malnutrition, not eating good. Uh, didn't get hurt too much physically, just the torturing and the things like that. And then uh, we, when, when we finally cleaned up Leyte, uh, and then they put us in the hospital, as I said, and we came out okay, went back to our units, and just took it easy for three or four weeks, had a beautiful place on the beach, nice, uh, just as beautiful as any of the beaches you see in these cattle, uh, travel logs. We, lived, we had a good life for three or four weeks there. White sand beaches, tropical waters, palm trees loaded with coconuts, bananas hanging from trees, mangoes, all the fresh fruit we wanted, and the natives to do our work, do our laundry. We took it easy for a while. And then they came around, and the generals decided to uh, visit all units. So we congregate four or five units at a, at a time. He was going to give us a talk of where we were going. And for the first time, he said, for the first time, we're going to tell you where you're going. He said, we're going to Okinawa. Yeah. You know, the Pacific is loaded with islands with all funny names. And it didn't mean anything to us. He says, well, he says, I'm going to tell you right now, Okinawa is the first of the Japanese home islands. And he says, you know, it's not going to, you think you've had it tough now? He says, it can be worse when you get there. So we're going to start an intensified training program, new weapons, new methods, new training to cope with what you're going to have come happening to you so you be prepared and learn your lessons well. He says, look at the man sitting next to you. And he said, we did. He says, no. He says, the reason I tell you to do that, he says, when we get through in Okinawa, one of you is going to be there. They expected 50% casualties. See? Let's hold that for a minute. We're going to... Uh, take two, interview of Mr. Arthur C. McMonaco, uh, Carthage Armory, 28th March, 2001. Art, we were talking about you were being, you were preparing for the invasion of Okinawa. What actually happened? 
Well, I guess I left off you telling telling you where the general had gotten all the units together and told us to take pay good attention to the training we we're going to have because it's a new type of training. We we're being furnished with all new new types of weapons that they come up with, uh, new strategies, and uh, I told you about the kamikaze planes that we first experienced in the Philippines. So we knew that was going to be a probably a big obstacle in Okinawa, the closer you get to Japan. Because you got to realize at this point, the closer we get to Japan, the shorter their supply lines are getting, and their advancements could be a lot shorter being close to them. Our supply lines and having to go greater distances to meet them were taking place at the same time. Of course, we were better equipped to do that than they were, no question. So when I told you that he said that uh, look at the man sitting next to you because one of you wouldn't be back, uh, wouldn't make it through that, they expected 50% casualties in Okinawa. And he said, so go to work and learn your lessons. And we did. Two weeks of very intensive training. Got on ships, sailed north, went to Okinawa. Easter Sunday morning, April the 1st, 1945, we landed at Okinawa. And I had to transfer off my ship and go on to another smaller boat to meet with the infantry unit that I was going to go. I was in the initial landing, uh, going to be on shore ready. So as soon as the artillery got in, and they might be need it, I'd be ready to give the uh, transmissions back for fire mission. So I got off my boat, and uh, just as about maybe 400 yards away, just as I, uh, we got away from that boat, uh, the kamikaze attack started. And a kamikaze plane came right down, hit the ship I just left, killed everybody on the bridge. And we had one commanding officer, Lieutenant Tanzillo, who uh, was one of our uh, colonels, not lieutenant. He got killed there. So I went and met, met with this infantry unit, and we went right in on shore. Now, the, the Navy had developed a strategy for coping with the kamikazes. And what they did, any ship, there were 700 ships went from the Philippines to, the, to Okinawa. And when we got there, every ship who was not involved in the actual invasion, supply ships, troop ships, ammunition ships, anything like that, uh, just the, the uh, battle wagons that we had a couple of them, had an uh, aircraft carrier, had a lot of cruisers, uh, a lot of destroyers, anyone, combat ship who was not had to support the invasion was give, uh, given the job of being out 20 miles out to sea and they formed them in a circle mm -hmm. and they just steamed in a circle continuously steaming like that. The strategy being was air, air reconnaissance showed where the airstrips were on Okinawa so they knew which direction that the attacks by air would come from. So they positioned those ships in a strategic area so they could meet that onslaught so ships are sailing in a big circle, you couldn't see one side of the circle from the other, and the kamikazes would fly over, and when they came over the outside of the circle, they sent up a curtain of fire. You can, I don't know how anything ever got through it. Uh, you couldn't tell it much in the daytime, but if you saw it at night, uh, it's just a solid sheet of metal going up. And you got to remember that they're shooting bra uh, tracers up, and a tracer is only every fifth bullet. So you see uh, how much is going up there, you're only seeing one fifth of what's going up. And it's an actual curtain. And so they did. They'd get a bunch of those planes shot down by that side. Then they'd come over the middle of the circle, nothing's happening. But when they got to the inside of the circle, they'd get another uh, uh, curtain of fire going up at them, and they took more out. But in spite of that, they came over such numbers that some always got through. And they did. They, they crashed into ships, they crashed, they crashed into uh, smaller boats landing, groups of men that were on shore, uh, supply, uh, piles of supplies, things like that. And they did a lot of damage. So we got in, they, they, they didn't meet us on the beaches, as far as the Japanese on, on the island. They, they sucked us in for a couple of miles, thinking to attack us and flank us, you see. So we got in, surely enough, we got in a, a couple of miles, and uh, all of a sudden they did. They came out with full, full fury. And from that day on, there was never a day that wasn't fighting, constant fighting, for nearly four months, day after day. And it was intense. One, one place I remember called the escarpment. It was like a, a line of low hills and cliffs, 30 to 50, 60 feet high. You couldn't climb up them, they were so steep, even as, as they were more like a hill than a cliff, but you still couldn't go up them. And seeing this, they had planned, they brought grappling hooks and some ladders that would reach the lower places, 30 foot ladders. When we got to that, they were going to try to get up there, they put these ladders up, and as soon as the infantrymen climbed up those ladders, and I'm with them because they figured they might need artillery support up in there. Uh, so my team was with them. As soon as these infantrymen stuck their head up over the top, the Japs were there waiting, shooting them right down as fast they went up. So finally they, they said, well, let's throw grenades. So everybody, these infantrymen all had grenades, and they were throwing them up, and 
you have to throw them right back down. So they developed a strategy of counting, count three and then throw it. By the time the grenade got up there, because it takes five minutes for, uh, five seconds for a grenade to explode after you let it out of your hand. And so they had to try to time it. But even that, it still wasn't working. And they called for more grenades, and they brought some more brought the grenades up in, in the boxes that they came in. I was helping taking them out of the boxes, out of the fiber case, and hand them to the infantrymen. And they were throwing, and these guys were throwing, getting frustrated. Grown men crying in frustration, because nothing was happening. And they were getting hurt just as much as they were, the damage they were doing. So finally, they, they were able, with this strategy, to, to cause a lot of damage. And they did get a few men on top. And then we started, started getting more, and we did take over that ridge. And that was called the Shuri Ridge, the Naha Line on the Shuri Ridge. And it was intense fighting there for two days before we could break, break all across it. And then from then on, we just slowly went up to Okinawa all up a little bit at a time. We got halfway through the island before the, before we, the war was over at, at that time. But we had a lot of casualties, just like they predicted. And, and not only do we have that, the typhoon hit us. It destroyed a lot of our equipment. I, we had a, a, a plane, a C-5 plane, L-5 plane. It was a Piper Cub we used for artillery observer. And they had, uh, that got destroyed. That was one I would have gone up in to observe fire as an artillery observer if it came needed. Mm -hmm. And we had to sit on that thing and hold it down under the typhoon to keep it from blowing away. And uh, that typhoon cost uh, 17 inches of rain fell in two weeks as a result of that typhoon. And the plane was just one big mud hole. So now here's another thing we're fighting, the, the elements in the, in the mud. And I, I got up with my infantry unit. I was with them for 32 days. Never got back my unit for 32 days. And all I had to eat during that 32 days was whatever rations the infantry fellows could get up to me because we couldn't get back to get them. Couldn't get, I never had a hot meal for that time. Uh, didn't shave for that time. Didn't change my clothes for that time. And I was a sorry mess when it, we finally got that. I was able to get back after that. I was hungry. They sent me back to the supply depot, got me some new clothes, got me some food. But we had an awful time in Okinawa there. And uh, finally, we're up three quarters of the island. And this one morning, I finally got back to my unit. And incidentally, uh, the, during the war, they issued to the infantrymen, any man, infantryman that spent 30 days or more in combat, was issued the combat infantryman's badge. I earned that, being with the infantry as long as I was. They, they made an exception. They gave me one. Gave me a little raise in pay, too. <laughs> Not much. But they did change the regulations. Instead of holding it to just the infantrymen, they said anybody who spent that much time in combat deserves it. Doesn't have to be an infantryman. And I got it. That's, that's probably the proudest thing I ever got. And it was, because those, those infantrymen took such good care of us. Because they knew they needed us to do those missions. When they, when they needed the artillery, they needed to have a crack team there to do it. And we had to do the job. And we were good. We were good. We know how, we know how to do our job and, and stay alive to do it. You know, as you told me, what the casualty rate was among our artillery observers. And I, when I stop and think of the odds, I always, to this day, I look back and say, why me? You see, because I've lost 42 friends doing the same job. And you often wonder, but as I went back over my life a few years ago, through all the things that I've done in my life, I found the reasons why me. If I hadn't been here to do them, it wouldn't have been done. Who would have done that? Well, see? let's talk about that, and then we'll come back to a couple of World War II okay. things. What happened after the war? After the war, well, first of all, let's get to the end of the war. Okay. How we get to the end of the war is uh, we're fighting our, our, our hearts off in Okinawa when one morning, I'm standing on a radio watch, back at the guns, incidentally, we had one radio set up so we could pick up newscasts from Hawaii and San Francisco. We had a special high-powered radio. And the captain had me back there. He took me under his wing because he knew he was losing us faster than he could afford. And he took me under his wing. He didn't like to send me out anymore than... Absolutely necessary, because he knew the odds are against us. So he says, I want you to stand radio, watch your art, be ready if you need you on a machine gun or something. I said, okay. So I'm listening on this radio. About 10 o'clock this morning, this uh, news, newscast came over and said that uh, we have a new report that the bombing raid has been conducted on Japan, and a bomb has been dropped in a, on a city in Japan, the power of about 20,000 tons of TNT. And I couldn't imagine 20,000 tons of TNT. I knew what a 105 shell would do out there in front of me and what damage that did. But what is 20,000? What, you know, just, just, we thought it was an Orson Welles type of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I said to the captain, I said, come over and listen to this. And it was repeated. He said, gee, he just shrugged his shoulders, I don't know. So he decided to call headquarters. He got 
back up at the division headquarters, and they said, yeah, we got the report, but we're investigating it, and that's where they left it. So over the morning until about the middle afternoon, this report kept coming. So finally it came down officially from the, from the United States, from Washington, that this had happened and that they were going to use this weapon again if Jabad did not surrender. Two days later, three days later, we dropped the second one. And that was how the war ended. We never would have got off in Okinawa if it hadn't been for that. Because we were four months getting half the island, you see. And imagine going into Japan proper. So now all of a sudden the war's over, we just couldn't believe it. Just, just like that, the war's over. We, I don't remember rejoicing. I do remember my sitting down, I think, saying a prayer, being pretty thankful. I might have cried a little bit. But it was just like in a dream, you know. And finally, it, it hit us all that the war was over, and they got us all back to, meanwhile, it, in the, on the beaches where they'd landed, they set up all kinds of facilities, showers, mess halls, or places to eat, not mess halls, but places to eat, hot food, things like that. And we started getting good food and everything like that. And they got us together, issued us all new clothes, uh, took all our stuff away from us, including our weapons and everything, because they were pretty beat up. I guess I looked pretty sick when I came back in that 32 days. My clothes were all torn. My helmet had a dozen dents in it from my own artillery out in front. And uh, I, as young as I was, I did manage to get some peach fuzz here, about an inch long. <laughs> and uh, I, I never shaved only two or three days, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and when I came back, I, I guess I, I, wouldn't, I don't think I'd like to see myself in a mirror, because I must have looked pretty bad. Um, so we got, they got us all outfitted, got us all cleaned up, put us on boats, we sailed to Japan. And our job was to go to northern Japan. We landed in the port of Aomori, which is in the horseshoe part of Honshu, northern Honshu Island, which is the biggest island. It's a big horseshoe there, and it's in a bay. Right in the end of the bay is the, this port. That's where we landed. A strange thing ha happened when we landed. That's in the same latitude as we are. So their winters are exactly like us. A lot of snow, a lot of cold. Summer's just like ours. So when we landed there, we went in combat loaded. They gave us all new weapons. We went in with bullets and the guns. We had them unlocked, but we had bullets and the guns. They told us, we don't know how we're going to be received. We don't know what the population is going to do. So we went in, and we went in just the way we were, nice and slow, got off the boats, walked down the main street of this town, going to the railroad station to get on a train that would take us to another village, which was where we were going to be occupying an army base that was there. So as we walked down the street, the Japanese people were on each side of the street. All the, the whole town was out. As we walked down the streets, as we came abreast of them, the people would bow their heads, turn their back to us. And we took this as a kind of a sneer, an insult. Couldn't understand why. We, we felt kind of bad about that. We weren't there to hurt them. We got on our train, went into this village in Hirosaki, it was, a, was the name of the village, and they put us in this uh, army emplacement camp. It was a great big quadrangle with just big wooden buildings around it. Training camp for Japanese soldiers. That was our occupation station. Then they let set me back up to Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island, back to the division artillery. And that's where I spent that winter with uh, the division artillery. And of course, I'd been sick. I had malaria and all of my ears from the artillery was in bad shape, ringing all the time, earaches and everything else. So I had to be given light work, and they put me in the office doing work. And that's what I spent in Japan, northern Japan doing. We had it good. Uh, the city was a modern city. Went skiing every day because they had nice ski slopes there. Uh, movies at night, good food, a lot, a lot, so much I could tell you, probably more time than we've got. But we, we, we just a complete departure from what we've been through, you see. Mm -hmm. It was kind of hard to get used to. And we're always looking over our shoulder, in a sense, you know, thinking well, something bad's got to happen here, but it didn't. Uh, in the other village, we were quarantined for two weeks before we could go into the village and meet the people and anything. So when they lifted, lifted the quarantine, because they didn't want us to bring anything to the Japanese, and they didn't want, we didn't want to get anything from them. We didn't know what diseases or sicknesses. So uh, when they finally let us go into town uh, this September morning, I'm walking down the, the street going into town. Here's all these little kids all going to school, just like they are here. Happy little kids going to school. And they'd look at us in Ohio, and I kept on New York. Mm -hmm. Ohio, and I said, New York. They always got that smile, you know, that they have. So we got into town, and we first place we hit as we get in the other towns is Kimono Shop. So we went in there. I said, I'm going to see if I can't get a kimono or two. We bought the place out. They had maybe 15, 20 kimonos. But the three of us that were there, we bought them all out. And I was going to send enough kimonos home so all my sisters and aunts and uncles could have one. 
And so when we were in there talking with the proprietor, and he spoke pretty fair English, and I said, can I ask you something? He says, yes. I says, uh, I'm walking in town, all the kids are coming up and asking me if I'm from New York, if, if I'm Ohio, and I keep telling them I'm not from New York. He says, no, no, no. He says, Ohio is a Japanese word for good morning. <laughs> Ohio gozaimasu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, so there's some awful pleasant, amusing things that happen, you see. Then, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Then I, I, I was assigned to drive the chaplain for three months in, in Hokkaido. Uh, again, I had to stay in such light duty, they put me, never, never any heavy duty for anybody to do, really, Army of Occupation. The main job that we had to do in that town was to go around the countryside and check anybody, take anything that appeared to be a weapon, uh, any guns of any kind, knives over six inches long, anything like that, we had to take away as weapons. And that was our primary job, keeping peace. Those people weren't going to be a, a problem. They were friendly. Uh, they, they they didn't even suffer through the war the way southern Japan did, you see. So we, we lived, lived pretty good there. So driving, I got signed for the chaplain. I had to take him wherever he had to go. And in that process, I met a lot of interesting people. We met a couple of, uh, a French missionary there. He had a church there. And he was in bad shape. He didn't have his, all the food. Because even though he was a, 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 a minister, the Japanese did not treat him the best. He was a foreigner. And he, he looked pretty bad like he hadn't had good feed, so we managed to get him feed and medicines, things like that, to take care of his people. And uh, he introduced us to some some pretty big people. And one person we met, he turned out to be, he was an educator, a teacher in one of the Japanese uh, colleges. And uh, he was a philosopher. He told me, I'm a philosopher. And I that didn't mean much to what a philosopher is in my mind. It's just somebody smarter than me. So he invited the chaplain over to dinner one night. So I took the chaplain over. And uh, he said, I don't know how long I'm going to be. He says, you can wait or you go back. And he had no way of calling me. I says, no, I better wait because I don't know how long it'll be. And I just started getting ready to go. And this young lady comes out of the house and she says, come have, have dinner with us. She spoke broken English, but I couldn't understand. And I says, no, I'm not supposed to. I wasn't supposed to associate with the officers as it was back then. And she says, no, no, it's all right. You come in. My father says you are to come. And as a customer, if the guest invites you, you come, no matter who else you're with. So I went in, and it, 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 he said, uh, no, he says, you, you are part of this party. You come sit down. And they did. They went through the whole ceremony of a, uh, of a Japanese dinner, the, the tea ceremony, which is kind of a religious thing, uh, the cu customs of little dove's eggs and rice in every form, and the rice cakes and rice boiled and rice steamed and rice with everything else and all the things that you know, good. <laughs> And sweet cakes that they make, and very good. And so we were talking. So I was talking with this uh, philosopher, and I said to him, I said, a strange thing happened when we landed on the other island. Mm. When we walked down the street, and I said, uh, the people turned their backs on us. And I said, we, we didn't think that was very polite. Oh, no, he says, that was, a, that was showing respect. I said, well, how so? He says, well, when it was decided that the war was over for us, and the, and the emperor, and it was the first time the people had heard the emperor's voice, they never heard him, and they were not allowed to see him in public. Only certain people were. As, as uh, average Japanese never saw their emperor, never heard him. They just knew about him, treated him as a god. And he says, no, he says, when the emperor for the first time talked on radio, he told us that when the American troops came into Japan, that we were to give them a great deal of courtesy, that we were not going to come in and do anything wrong to them, and that they were to tr treat the American troops with the same respect they did their emperor. And that's what they did. They don't consider themselves worthy enough to cast their eyes on their emperor. So when they turn their back and bow their heads, it means they're showing a thought sign of respect to us. So, so you see the different philosophies in, 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 in the world and in the societies of the world. And it's very interesting. And I got more education that year in Japan about foreign people than I'd ever had before. That you don't get out of books, you see. Okay, all right, let's skip ahead now because we need to cover some other material. What happened to you after the war? After the war, well, let's see, to get, it, to, to get out of the war, uh, they sent me after the, uh, from northern Japan, was a, get, there was a point system for getting out of the surface at that time, so many points for every month. If you had uh, every invasion or battle, you got so many points. Any decorations they got, they gave you pro points. If you had Purple Heart, they gave you points. And when you achieved, uh, achieved a number of points, qualified you, they sent you home. Well, I didn't have quite enough, but I was close. So they said, well, we'll send you down to Tokyo, Yokohama area. And from there, you'll go to a replacement depot. 
So when they got me the reevaluation center down in Tokyo, on the way down, incidentally, I have to tell you this story, subject to attacks of malaria quite frequently. And I, we'd been doing a lot of outdoor skiing, and I caught cold. Got on this narrow gauge train going south, and it was an unheated train, winter time. And with that cold, I wasn't feeling very good. And I come down with an attack of malaria on the train. And it was about seven, eight hundred miles, and it took about five days to go that far in Japan. It wasn't very fast. The tracks weren't in the best shape. A lot of snow kept progress going slowly. And by the time I got to Yokohama, I came down so, so sick, they had to take me off the train in an ambulance, take me to St. Luke's Hospital in Tokyo. And St. Luke's was a hospital that was built by American money donated back after the 1923 earthquake. Ooh. That money built that hospital. And I spent a month or 45 days in that hospital because I developed not only the malaria, but it turned into pneumonia. And I was in a coma for five days. I almost died. They were going to send a, ready sell a, send a telegram home. My folks was worried. They hadn't heard from me in those 45 days. So they got the Red Cross on it, found out where I was. But I was in there, and when I got out, the doctor said to me, when you go home, he says, you got to take it easy. He says, you got this malaria, this, you're always going to have it. And he says, this particular strain, he says, it'll probably kill you by the time you're 40. I said, what can I do to beat the odds? Well, he says, don't drink and don't smoke and don't chase too many girls. You know, just kiddingly, but he telling me to take it easy. I said, well, I said, I don't drink and I don't smoke anyway, believe it or not. I never developed the habits, even being subjected to it as much as we were in the Army. Mm. Or exposed, I should say. So uh, I said, well, that, that's, that's no problem. And he says, uh, you've got to have very extreme light duty. You can't do anything physical for a long time. So I went back to this ordinance base that they had signed me to temporary for going to the replacement depot. And it was on an island just off the width of a street off the mainland. And it was a former Ford plant. Henry Ford built that plant back in the 30s, and they built trucks for the Japanese in that plant. Well, when the war broke out, Japan took it over and built their own trucks. So we took it over and made an ordinance base out of it. And I was assigned to work in the orderly room there, doing clerical work. And I had free time. I had to be at the hospital in Tokyo every day for therapy and treatment. So my job was to get my work done, scheduled, in the office, get the reports all out, go change uniforms, have an early chow, drive to Tokyo, go to the hospital, and go through my, my uh, treatments and things, an hour or two. And then I had the rest of the day to myself, didn't have to be back till mid to 11 o'clock. That's what I spent my days for, several days going to. And I went to the, a very interesting place. It was, it was the Imperial Theater that only the officials and the emperor ever attended uh, functions. And they had renamed it the Ernie Pyle Theater. And uh, they had the best shows there, latest run movies from the States, uh, big stage shows from the States, Japanese stage shows there. Three times a week a change of show, all free, didn't have to cost. We could ride the trains all over Japan, no charge. Everything was free to us. We had a good time in Japan. It was such a wonderful thing to be able to do and, and learn comfortably, you see. Mm -hmm. Never knowing where you were going to leave. Every day I'd go in there and see that, see that. They had another theater right next to it which showed the latest news at home and short subjects, cartoons, and things like that. And then I'd go see the main show, and then I'd go back. I was assigned a Jeep. It was my own. I, I, I lived like a king in Japan. So another thing, right across the street was the Imperial Hotel. And that hotel was built back in the 30s again. Architect was uh, right, one of the greatest architects in the world. And it was an earthquake-proof hotel. It was built on a mud flat, but the floors were not collected to the, connected to the walls. So when an earthquake occurred, the walls might move or the floors might move, but they wouldn't move together, would, they wouldn't fall apart, and it worked. He had a, a great, great, uh, all, all these things I learned, you know, so interesting, you wouldn't hear about mm -hmm. this. And next to, in this hotel, every Saturday and Sunday, if you wanted to sweat out a line for three hours, stand in the street and wait, you can go in that hotel and you'd be in the nice dining room, and you'd eat with whoever was there, big people, little people, waited on by Japanese and very nice tuxes and things, nice meals, and all free. And there was sailors and soldiers from all services that were occupying Japan at the time. So we had some good times there. Now we're running down towards the bottom of okay. the tape, so I need to get you back to what did you do after the war? Okay, after the war, then I, uh, I got through the replacement depot, fourth replacement. They put us on a ship for, to, for coming home. We left Yokohama in July, uh, sailed the kind of a northern curved route, and came into Seattle, Washington. 
Fort Lewis, where he put us there, and the ship was the Marine Serpent. The only two ships' names I ever remember was the one I owned overseas on the Effingham and the one I came home on, the Marine Serpent. They took us to Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, took us to the biggest mess hall I ever saw. We could have anything we wanted to eat. They prepared any time of the day, pork chops, steaks, anything you wanted. So we got good feed. Immediately after that, they took us to a, a place where they let us uh, turn all our old clothes in and take a shower, take good clean showers. Took us to another warehouse, fitted us all out with all new uniforms, all new equipment. And they put, took us to another room, and they had dozens and dozens of people there. And all they did was measure us to make those uniforms that all fit. Mm -hmm. And then what we had to do, we left them, left them off, our names were on them. People were assigned to them, we had to go back the next day and pick them up. They had all our insignia and patches and everything all sewed on, and went home with all new equipment. Got on a train out of Fort Lewis, went around across the states, went, got into Fort Dix in uh, early July. I spent a week in there getting evaluated, uh, getting set up because of my disabilities. I qualified for some kind of compensation. Got me all my paperwork, gave me my, some, uh, some travel money, ticket home, and I went home, came, arrived in Watertown on August the 10th at 6 o'clock in the morning. No parades, no parties, the war was over. And your life after the war, did you marry? What did you do? I did. I came home and uh, I kept getting my attacks of malaria just as regular as could be. Every three months I could plan on it, very regularly. And I worked the summer. I went to Syracuse University. Uh, I wanted to get into broadcasting, so I went to radio school there, qualified for that. Got my ear in there, came back, tried to get a job in Watertown, but it was all sewed up. You had to know somebody, so I never got it. My first job after that was with the Watertown Daily Times. I worked in the advertising department for 11 and a half years. Over the years, I've had other jobs. Probably the best one I had, I worked at the post office for eight years, became senior clerk. Then I worked at, uh, uh, I bought a music store, ran that for 15 years. I meanwhile had married when I came out of the service before I went to school, or after I got out of school. Uh, raised, adopted two children, had one of our own. Um, did all the things I do. I ran a Boy Scout troop. I tell you these things because they enter, they go into the story I told you earlier. Ran a Boy Scout troop, trained an awful lot of boys in that that made it big in the world. As I said, I adopted two children and, and had one of our own. Uh, got in Knights of Columbus. I'm big in that still, 53 years, which got me into the lectures that I give in schools through the auspices of that and all these things. And I tell you these things because I told you earlier that my wife said, you ought to write all this stuff down. And I, I didn't hit me at first. But I got to think, why she want me to write all this stuff? Because she said, well, I, I could never, never remember all those things and all those dates. Then it hit me. Someday, there's going to be an obituary, and she wasn't going to be prepared. So she wanted me to have it ready for her. See? So I did. I wrote, and I kept writing and writing and writing <coughs> all the things I did. And then all of a sudden, it hit me when doing all this. I says, if I hadn't survived those other 42 guys that got killed over there, and me and one other, the death came home, if I hadn't survived all that, and I hadn't done the things that I did and married and had these children, what kind of a home might those children have been, been in? A better one or a worse one, you see? Uh, we would never have had the one that we had of our own. When I had the Boy Scout troop and these guys, Bob Hickey, he was a, an admiral in the Navy, commanded a big aircraft carrier, recently retired. Uh, men in Watertown, Burkhardt had a big plumbing business for years. He inherited that. Uh, this Bart Bonner's got his own television thing there on Stone Street. And he's got this beeper service and, and this answering service and all this stuff. These guys are successful. And, and at times they've come up and he said, geez, Art, thanks for what you taught me when you, you were my scoutmaster. So when you stop and think, all the lives that you touch, touch on, that's what I tell the kids in school, don't think one person is not important. As every person is important because everything you do in your life, every person you meet, every life you touch on, you have an effect on that thing. And, I says, and then I look back on this, I can see now why me. I think that's a good point to stop it. Can I ask one quick question? Sure. Just for my own. If you could say or explain one lesson that you took back from you um, being in the war. What lesson? What did you, you know, one lesson? One lesson? The biggest lesson I can tell you, war is not an answer to anything. Can I have you say and spell your name so I have that answer sure. too, please? Arthur C. Meco Monaco, M E C O. M O N A C O. And what years were you over overseas? For the and, uh, July 10th, overseas? In the war. Oh, in the war. July 10th, 1943 through August 10th, 1946. How old were you? Did you 
I was 18 when I went in and 22 when I came out. The best of my youth. Yeah. That's all I need, I think. Except I need a quick interview with you and I would. Let me zoom in on that. That was during basic training, 1943. <laughs> 18, 18, 18 years old. <laughs> this, where's my, it's a discharge, okay. Now if I can point out where I am here. Mm -hmm. Okay, can, can you hold that uh, flat, otherwise that, uh, oh. yeah. This way. Hold yeah, it up yeah. right. Yeah. And right. One, two. Number four, if you can focus on it. Number four. On the bottom row. You got one of your eyes kind of shut? Looks like. I got what? Yeah. Okay. It was a sunny day. <laughs> Fort Bragg is just like Fort, Fort Drum, all sand. And now we'll t explain to me what this picture is real quick. This, this is our basic training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And that's who you went overseas with? No, no. Okay. Not all of them. Okay. Just some of them. But this is the, we, this is the group we trained together as. And, but all of them did go overseas? Some went to Europe, but 42 of us went to the Pacific. Now, what's that top picture? Well, this is, out of these guys here, this, we formed a band, an oh. orchestra. At Fort Bragg. Now, which one are you? I'm playing the accordion right here. Second one on right here in the. Oh yeah. Can you see the print enough to read it? In there. Under the metals. Yep. Oh, because it'll tell you what they are. I sure can. No, the one at the very bottom, that's my latest accomplishment. New York State sent that to me. Just recently. In the top okay. picture. And I'm, okay, let's, let's see if we can get it here. Okay, the one fellow sitting down on the end, and I'm directly in back of him on the... Now, whereabouts are you? I'm on the very end of the picture, second one from the front row. There's a guy sitting in front of me, and I'm second one back of him. Okay. Kind of on his left. <laughs> 